Welcome to the Truth and Liberty broadcast. We believe we have a mandate to bring godly change to our nation and the world through the seven spheres or mountains of influence. To further this cause, we give away a product every week that will empower you to get involved in changing your life and changing our world. You can register for our weekly giveaway by subscribing at truthandliberty.net. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to receive weekly updates on guests, news, and much more. This is an interactive live cast, and we welcome your questions. To ask a question during the live cast, use the comment or chat features. Now get ready to dive into this week's topics with our hosts on location in Colorado, USA. Hello and welcome to the Truth and Liberty Livecast. I'm Richard Harris, the Executive Director of the Truth and Liberty Coalition. Uh, it's such an honor to have you joining us tonight and uh, we have a really special livecast in store for you tonight. Uh, it's uh, an interview that Andrew Womack and I conducted of Congresswoman Lauren Boebert. And uh, you, you're gonna really be blessed tonight. Congresswoman Boebert represents the third district uh, in uh, Colorado. And you, you've probably heard about her because she made uh, big headlines after she was sworn into office uh, shortly thereafter when uh, she's a real gun rights advocate. And she actually uh, attempted to wear her or carry her uh, sidearm, her pistol, onto the floor of the United States House of Representatives uh, to, for her own safety and also to demonstrate uh, the, the importance of our Second Amendment rights. But Lauren Boebert is a strong uh, Christian. She is a strong conservative, and she is fighting and standing up for conservative values and principles in Washington, and we were just so blessed and honored to have an opportunity to sit down with her and find out more about her. And it's, it's a great interview, I'm telling you. You're gonna hear about uh, sort of her faith walk, her journey of how she came to the decision of running for Congress, what it was like as she upset uh, an incumbent Republican to win the nomination for her party for that congressional seat and then went on to win by a large margin and uh, and so uh, she's really great. And I just wanted to share before we uh, we start the interview that um, Truth and Liberty coming up this weekend, September 10th and 11th, is our annual conference, the Truth and Liberty Coalition Conference. And one of our keynote speakers is Lauren Boebert. So Congresswoman Boebert will be here at our campus in Woodland Park at Karis Bible College on uh, Saturday, September the 11th, to uh, speak in the one of the main sessions. We're also, Andrew's also going to minister uh, along with uh, Bishop E.W. Jackson. If you've never heard E.W. Jackson, you are missing out. You need to come to this thing if for no other reason but to hear him. Pastor Dwayne Sheriff, who is an incredible Bible teacher. And then we'll hear from another one of our congressmen um, uh, via video uh, pre-recorded message. It's going to be Congressman Doug Lamborn, who's an amazing patriot. And then uh, 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 Mario Murillo. Talk about a star-studded lineup. It's going to be awesome. And we're going to have numerous uh, uh, workshops dealing with everything from the LGBT issue in schools to election integrity. You won't want to miss this conference. It's free, no charge. You, if you want lunch, you're going to have to pay for your lunch. But other than that, you are free to come. And you can register on our website at truthandliberty.net. Again, it's Friday night, this Friday, September 10th, and all day Saturday from 8 to, five, 8 to 6, I think, and it's all mountain time. And uh, another thing you won't want to miss out on is on Saturday, we're going to have a special custom written dramatic production commemorating the 20th anniversary of the terrorist attacks of 9-11. And it's not going to be some morning, uh, you know, sad thing, although it, it's going to be serious, but it's going to be powerful. And it's going to remind you about why you can be proud to be an American. It's going to be awesome. Last thing I want to say before I turn it over to the interview is check out our resources page if you haven't done that at truthandliberty.net. All kinds of information on there to help you be equipped and stand for truth in the public square, including right now links Links to Liberty Council, LC.org, uh, where they have all kinds of stuff to help you with the COVID situation. And then also I wanted to mention that uh, upcoming here is the Destiny Conference on September 16th through the 18th with Pastor Dwayne Sheriff, and then the Minister's Conference on
on October 4th through the 8th. All of those are going to be awesome, uh, but we uh, really hope that you'll come out and attend the Truth and Liberty Conference this coming weekend, September 10th and 11th. And so now it's an honor for me and a privilege to be able to uh, introduce to you Congresswoman Lauren Boebert, a Republican who represents the 3rd District of Colorado, as Andrew and I have the very special honor of interviewing, interviewing her, and it's going to be a great show. God bless you. We'll see you next time. So tonight we are really blessed and honored to have uh, Congresswoman Lauren Boebert with us, and she's from Colorado. Uh, she's got quite a story, and I'm sure we'll talk about some of these things, but uh, since I live in Colorado, I saw her ads when she was running for Congresswoman, and uh, she emphasized a lot of things, but uh, she's gotten a lot of attention because she's really pro-Second Amendment, and she carries, and she had a cafe and rifle where she and all of the waitresses carried, and uh, man, she's caused no small stir. Nancy Pelosi is, I imagine, considering Lauren a thorn in her side. <laughs> uh, we've got a lot of mutual friends, and uh, David Barton, who's on our board of directors here at Truth and Liberty, when we told him that uh, Lauren was going to be with us, he said, oh, man, that woman loves God. He was really excited. And so that's really the best recommendation I can give her. She's got a lot of other things to her credit. But, uh, Lauren, we are just so blessed to have you on our Truth and Liberty broadcast. Thank you for coming on with us. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be here with you tonight. And uh, let me start by asking how did a lady who runs a cafe in Rifle, Colorado ever become a, co a U.S. Congresswoman? There's got to be quite a story here. Uh, I think there is. There's a lot of moving parts that were taking place. Um, I started off just as a, a grassroots activist with the National Popular Vote Compact. Governor Jared Polis had signed it into to law that we would uh, join that compact and not participate in the Electoral College. We would send all of our votes to the winner of the national popular vote. And so I started collecting signatures and, uh, and, and just I, I started hearing the frustration of people and I was frustrated with them and I began to complain with them but the complaining wasn't really getting much done. And uh, I, I got a little more frustrated when a presidential candidate came to Colorado after he said that he was coming after our Second Amendment. Uh, <laughs> Robert Francis O'Rourke told everyone he's gonna take our guns. And at that time, the frustration led me to do something. I drove three hours to his presidential rally with my Glock on my hip. And I looked him in the eye and told him he's not gonna do that. And uh, so in that moment, I learned that there were millions of people who just needed a voice, who just needed representation. And I could possibly effectively do that. And so uh, that's when I threw my hat in the ring uh, to, to represent the people and to give them a strong voice and a sense of uh, direction and hope for our country. And uh, I, I'm proud to have taken on a five-term incumbent and now be a sitting U United States Congresswoman. Uh, but I, I couldn't say that any of that was just through my own works alone. I had to believe God all the way. And uh, you know, it was, it was him who told me that he qualified me. He had justified me and set me apart for this time. And, it, and without those words from him, I would have never stepped into it because I could tell myself all day long the reasons why I can't do this. And, uh, and he, he had already qualified me. So who am I to argue with that? Mm -hmm. uh, and so just, just stepping out in faith and being there, um, it, it's, been, it's been tremendous. And I read in your bio here that you were actually raised in a uh, democratic household on welfare. Now, how did, a, how did you ever become a conservative? What, what was the process? So my mom simply believed a lie. Uh, she traded the truth for a lie. And we were raised to believe that government is supposed to take care of us and that they would take care of us. And uh, that that they were capable of, of taking care of us and they had our best interests in mind. But soon I desired more. And instead of asking for another handout, I made something of myself. I began working at 15 years old at the Rifle McDonald's and I taught my, my, myself that I could be sufficient and that I could chart my own course and take care of myself far better than any government agency or elected official ever could. I've lived the Ameri American dream, and it's because of the American dream that I'm here today. I went from standing in line for government cheese to 
serving in Congress. And that's wow. a special story. But if we continue to allow socialist policies to be implemented, that upward mobility and that story will no longer be available. In America, we believe in equal opportunity, not equal outcomes. Man, that's yeah, awesome. That is awesome. What's the difference between those two things? I think today people are getting that all confused. What's the difference between equal opportunity and equal outcomes? All of us have the opportunity to put our hand to something and apply ourselves to achieve whatever we set our mind to, our hearts to, our desires to, uh, but we are not guaranteed a successful outcome. We can all begin from the very be from the very bottom and and work towards our goals. Uh, but not all of us are, are going to have the same outcome as one another. Uh, you know, I. I I'm, I'm a restaurant owner. I was able to go to McDonald's and develop a work ethic, bring mom home my first paycheck and, and have that pride and empowerment motivate me to, to continue to work harder and collect more and, and uh, try, to, try to get raises and promotions. Uh, and I could have stayed there forever. My outcome could have been climbing the ladder at McDonald's. But I stepped out and I became a business owner and there was a different path for me. So I opened my own restaurant. Now I sign the fronts of paychecks instead of just <laughs> instead of just receiving one. Amen. And and so there are different outcomes for all of us. But uh, the opportunities are available for each and every one of us here. And so you started the Shooter's Grill there in Rifle and uh, all you and your waitresses and stuff. Carrie, tell us how all that came to pass. Yes, so when we first opened my restaurant in Rifle, Colorado, we named it Shooter's Grill because we're in the only city in America named after a gun. But shortly after we opened our restaurant, uh, there was an altercation where a man was beaten and he lost his life outside of my restaurant. And that immediately prompted the question in me, how am I going to take care of everyone? How am I going to protect the people who are around me? So I took advantage of Colorado's open carry laws and I began to open carry. Soon after that, I had waitresses ask if they could carry too. And uh, we have training in place. Uh, we have, we go out target shooting and we host C CCW classes for concealed carry permits. We have tactical training and weapons retention training. And uh, I believe that Shooter's Grill with our open carry waitresses is the safest restaurant in America. <laughs> hey, man. Amen. Uh, you aren't the typical uh, restaurant owner. It doesn't <laughs> sound like, but that's awesome. <laughs> So tell me how it's been received on Capitol Hill. We've seen in the news that Pelosi was really upset with you wanting to carry and even put in metal detectors. What's going on in Congress? Speaker Pelosi fundamentally changed the interior structure of the Capitol because I showed up. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I, I do have my firearm in, in the Capitol complex, but we aren't allowed to carry on the House floor, and there are metal detectors in place. Um, but Speaker Pelosi goes around them. She's not fined the $5,000 fine uh, that she uh, and other Democrats voted uh, in place. Uh, but then we've, we've also seen Representative Clyborne go and uh, ignore the the rules for the metal detectors and now he's facing a fine but here's the deal just because he is on the other side of the aisle because he is a democrat i'm not going to say that's what you get you ought to pay that five thousand dollars i actually don't believe he should have to pay it and mm -hmm. i'm on his side i want him to join us in getting these things removed if we if 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 we acquiesce and cede our freedoms in congress what hope do the American people have for us to fight for their freedoms? And right now, the Democrats, they control the House, they control the Senate, the presidency. At times, it seems like they control the, the Supreme Court even. Um, we know they are in control of the fourth branch of government, all of the bureaucracies and those three-letter agencies. Uh, but look at the results. Uh, gas prices are up. Inflation is rising to the cost of, of groceries for hardworking Americans. Businesses can't hire folks because people are making more on unemployment. And in the West, energy companies have been shut down with these extreme executive orders coming from the Biden regime. So I say it's going pretty badly for America. Uh, I think metal detectors are um, just a glimpse at what the Democrat Party is, is planning for our country. It's all about complete control. Well, you're in the thick of this battle now. What's going on there in Congress? Is there any positive news? What's what's happening? Well, that being said, there are a surprisingly good number of, of decent, God-fearing 
members up there. And that was something that surprised me to the upside. I thought going to Washington, D.C., there might be four good guys. <laughs> but there are <laughs> I a think lot that more. sounded optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, uh, and, and they're there working hard to make sure our children have the same freedoms and liberties that we've been blessed with. God never leaves himself without a witness. And I think of... I think of that when my Freedom Caucus colleagues and I, like uh, Chairman Andy Biggs or Jim Jordans or even other members of Congress like Thomas Massey, uh, get together. I, I believe that this is a, a group of witnesses that God is just showing himself through and, and proving his goodness. It is the goodness of God that leads men to change their mind about him. And so mm -hmm. I believe that he's taking these godly men and women uh, who are, are set apart for righteousness to, to proclaim what, what he has planned for America. And right now, it's, it's the greatest honor of my life to serve in Congress at a time like this. And I will continue to work for, with these good, godly people to hold the line and defend our constitutional and our biblical values. Well, you've gotten a lot of press since you've been there. Most of it has been about how radical you are. And, uh, you know, I've, I've been the butt of the press myself, so I take that with a grain of salt. But how have the people received you? Have these other Congress people received you pretty well? Like on both sides. I'm sure you've had some that are really upset. Yes. So I... The Republicans have been fantastic. Uh, you know, I think that there's there's some that are definitely a part of the establishment, and that's what I ran against. I ran against the establishment when I first took on a five-term incumbent. Um, I was I I was not satisfied with electing someone who had Jim Jordan talking points, but we were getting Mitt Romney results. Mm. <laughs> so I, I definitely <laughs> challenged that narrative and said, if you're going to run as a conservative and, and tell us that you're fighting for us and promoting these conservative values and biblical principles, then I want to see it in your voting record. And in Colorado's third district, our Republican representative had the lowest conservative score. Uh, so there, there are certainly still some folks there that um, fit into that same mold and vote Democrat light, maybe to appease the other side, thinking that it's going to gain them something. But uh, I believe when we run as conservatives, we win. But when we legislate as conservatives, the people win. So uh, the Republican Party as a whole has, has really um, been very welcoming. We're all working to, to get the majority back in 2022 so we can actually put forward some good legislation. Right now, Speaker Pelosi controls the floor. So even the good legislation that we are putting forward, it's difficult to get it to the floor for a vote. And uh, I, I do have to mention my, my colleagues on the other side. There have been several that I've had wonderful conversations with, and I hope that continues to grow. Um, right now, we're not meeting a lot in person in Washington, D.C., uh, and, and there's a lot of excuses around that. I, I don't um, believe that they're justified, but there's a lot of uh, Zoom meetings that take place, and then there's a great divide. But I speak with the Colorado delegation, and, uh, and I really have enjoyed getting to know them and talking about our differences and working on solutions for Colorado. And then there's some other great Democrats uh, from, from throughout the country that I speak with. Uh, I, I gotta tell you about one particular man, his uh, representative, Henry Cuellar. He is so full of joy. And that is the very first thing that I ever noticed about him. And I made it a point to tell him. And so he's someone that I like to uh, just be in the presence of because he's so happy. Man, that's encouraging. You know, I, 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 this will be taken wrong, but anyway, I'm going to say it. But when people get to where they will kill a child in their mother's womb, I just honestly feel like those people will do anything. They'd stab you in the back or something. And so yeah. basically, I, I've heard that there isn't a single Democrat that is pro-life. Now, that may not be accurate, but if that is accurate, well, then that has given me such a low opinion. It's kind of encouraging to hear you say that there's some Democrats out there that have a little bit of sense left. Yes. Well, I, I really want to share my experiences and my stories with them. And just to sit there and, and yell at them and tell them how wrong they are isn't going to, to do anything for anyone. Nothing productive will come of that. I've had so many people tell me that they can't wait until I challenge AOC. Well, I want to sit down and tell her my story and, and, and really just share 
my life experiences with her. You know, uh, it, it said, if you speak to the fool in a man, the fool will rise up. But if you speak to the king in a man, the king will rise up. And so I'm hoping to have that influence to be able to, to just change hearts and, and see those stones removed and, and, a, and, a, and a heart of flesh just replaced. Um, and so I, I, I'm just encouraged to be there right now and speaking life into a lifeless situation, speaking hope where there is no hope. I, I serve a God who is the God of resurrection and Amen. he can bring anything back to life. Wow. Man, that's encouraging yeah, to me. Praise, praise God. God. You mentioned this a uh, couple of Democrats that you've been having some meetings with. Are you getting positive responses? Are they being receptive to what you're saying? So uh, it's interesting. It's it's almost the same response. Um, once once I start talking with someone from the other side, uh, we we talk for 10, 15, 20 minutes, and then they say something like, "Wow." This is a very reasonable and rational conversation. Amen. <laughs> you say, yes, it is. And, um, and they, then they, they tell me about other people who need to hear this. And so I, I do believe that there is the stories, the headlines, um, maybe even the TV persona. When we are calling out things that are unconstitutional, ungodly, and un-American, and I'm, I'm not going to bow down and, and quit that, uh, but, but there is some there is a place for conversation and uh, and those conversations need to take place. And I can't wait until the house has order again and we can have good solid debate once again. Man, that is great. Yeah. And uh, you know, some of these people that you're talking about, they've been listening to the 10 Spies Network and getting all of the weird things. And when they find out that you aren't that extreme, I think that that's really a good basis for finding some common ground. Mm. You had mentioned legislation that you're trying to get through, and because Pelosi is running the thing, uh, you, you also had mentioned prior to this broadcast something about a discharge petition. What are you working on? Yes, so Congressman Chip Roy from Texas and I have a discharge petition. Uh, we have taken my legislation, the Protecting American Energy Jobs Act, and we've put that in a discharge petition. Um, what that does is we collect 218 signatures. We'll need a handful of Democrats to join us. Uh, but we get this uh, petition with the 218 signatures and it forces my bill to the floor for a vote. Like I said, Speaker Pelosi has complete control of the floor schedule, so she determines what we vote on. And it's really unfortunate because there is no unity and there's no such thing as bipartisan because there are only Democrat legislation coming to the floor. So the, for the districts who have sent a Republican to represent them, they don't even get their uh, their chance to have Republican legislation voted on. Uh, so this is a tool that we use in the minority. There are, uh, I, I believe, just three pieces of uh, three discharge petitions that are currently active, and uh, one of them is actually the Born Alive bill. And um, it's been said that Democrats won't sign on to that. And I, I like, I would love to have conversations with them just explaining you know, how, how good life is and how, what it's like to actually um, have life growing on the inside of you uh, and, and just to, to speak that into them. But one of them is my discharge petition. And I do have hope that we will get that to the floor. And what mine does is reverses President Biden's executive orders on the Keystone XL pipeline, our oil and gas leasing, and it prevents the executive branch from ever um, putting forward a moratorium on federal leases again. So it puts us back to the Trump energy uh, policies, the Trump era energy policies, and it's really great for America. And I do believe that there are Democrats in energy rich districts that will sign on to this. So Lauren, uh, could you give us your website so that if people want to find out exactly what you're doing and that maybe how they could support that and be a part of it, could you give that to us? Yes, my website is laurenforfreedom.com. Uh, four is spelled out, F-O-R, laurenforfreedom.com. And on there, you can learn more about me um, and uh, you can contribute to help me out. This is going to be a very difficult race. I am a target because I'm doing exactly what I promised I would do. I am standing up for the Constitution, for your rights, for your liberty, and I'm standing up for righteousness. And uh, so I certainly have a target on my back. Uh, in, in Colorado, we're going through redistricting. And uh, so the 
I'm, I'm certainly um, going to feel the effects of that, but I do believe that we'll come out of that victorious, but I need all the help that we can get. Um, so folks coming in and supporting me, those small dollar donations mean so much more than any corporate pack check, which I'm not chasing after anyway. I, I wasn't elected by special interest groups. I was elected by the people, and that's who I'm here to serve. Mm. So could you explain just a little bit more? I know that when you're running for re-election, there's a lot of expense in all of that, but what is the expense as you're in Congress? What do you need money for there? So most of it is advertising. Um, and so we, we do some stuff on the official side in messaging to the district, uh, but with the House of Representatives, this is a two-year term. So the day after election is when you start campaigning again and begin to build up those, fill up those coffers so you are able to withhold, uh, withstand uh, the enemy's attacks because they start coming right away. There are eight Democrats who are filed to run for my seat. Wow. And uh, they aren't really running against each other yet. They're all running a general election campaign. So they are all attacking me and using resources to do it. So I need to be able to have resources to get my message out and tell people what I am doing for them. Because I'm not just fighting against people. I am fighting for uh, the Constitution, for freedom, for America. And um, especially when we roll into next year, I need to be ready in January to start flooding the markets with our message and encouraging people to be involved, to get engaged, and to not give up. There's a lot of people who are frustrated with the 2020 elections who think that their vote does not matter. Their vote matters now more than ever. And so we have to be there to, to let them know that there are, there are still people fighting for the right reasons, and, uh, and we're not giving up. Well, let me just encourage our voters, our viewers here to uh, get out and support you because I, I suspect running against a five-term incumbent uh, that you were way outspent. And I know that the Democrats, they are very strategic. And when they find somebody like you who's making a splash, uh, they're going to have not only these individuals running, but the Democratic National Committee and so many yes. PACs are going to be supporting them. So I'm sure you could use the support. Absolutely. And uh, the DCCC has been after me uh, for a very long time. And, uh, you know, I've been encouraging the folks here in the district with these eight Democrats that are running. They aren't really my opponent. They're going to spend money against me and they're going to raise a lot of money and, and flood the markets. Uh, but no matter what they promise the voters here in Colorado's third district, they can, they can make promises for our water, our agriculture, our ranchers, our farmers, our schools, our rural way of life. But at the end of the day, if a Democrat were to win this seat, they work for Nancy Pelosi, not the people who elected them. I see it every single day. There are pro-life Democrats who will not sign on to pro-life legislation because Nancy Pelosi's hold on them is so strong. Wow. There are so many people who have made promises, so many Democrats who have made promises to their voters that they will never be able to, uh, to fulfill because they work for Nancy Pelosi. So ultimately, she is my opponent. <laughs> mm, wow. Let me just take a step back from the politics for a second and say these, these people you're talking about, the Democrats who you know that they don't necessarily agree, but they're so intimidated and controlled, and then just the out and out attacks on you, how do you handle this personally and keep from becoming negative and hurt? How do you keep your family from being hurt through this? The joy of the Lord is my strength, and uh, you know, with with the uh, with that joy, I draw up from the wells of salvation, and that really is what keeps me strong. Um, I have the armor of God, and that is all forward facing to help me in the battle. I have the helmet of salvation, and the the shield of faith, and the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of truth, and uh, the sword of the spirit, the shoes of, of peace. That's all forward facing for the battle. So I am well armed to go into this battle, but also I have the glory of the Lord that is my rear guard, that is protecting me from the onslaught from behind. When I am not paying attention, I know that he has my back and that means he has my family protected as well. I know that God would not have called me to something that he didn't give me the ability to overcome and, and be victorious in. I, I really look to our founding fathers and the way they lived out their faith in, in establishing this country, the greatest nation this world has ever seen. 
they wanted independence. They had already been in the battle. And then finally, they took a moment and they declared it. They wrote the vision down. They made it plain. And, uh, and, and they declared independence before they were ever free. And not only did they declare their independence, they went out and celebrated it like it already belonged to them. And then they went out and finished the battle and then they were free. And that is uh, it, it just a wonderful real life expression of faith that you declare the end from the beginning and you could celebrate it right there from the beginning. Know that the battle is the Lord's and the battle has already been won. So um, I've read the end of the book. I know that we win <laughs> um, going into this. I'm not afraid. I, I'm not afraid of what's coming my way. I am not affected by the negative uh, attacks. I know exactly what I signed up for, and those don't move me. I am moved by what I believe, and I believe God. And that's awesome. Wow. And before the broadcast, we were sharing that uh, Mark Hankins, you know them personally, and uh, yes. Bob Yandian, who's on my board of directors, was instrumental in being an impact on your marriage, and Rick Renner's, one of your favorite. Yes teachers and so just the people that I know that you love and have received from you've got to have a lot of word in you too you've been sitting under the word and that makes a big difference absolutely I was actually just speaking with one of my friends recently um, who has a tremendous testimony she and I were serving God together in the church she was cleaning toilets praying over the commodes do you know that people pray over <laughs> your, your commodes <laughs> in church she, awesome. she would pray and, and bless the toilets in the church and and uh, and I would go into the jail and I would minister to women and at that time neither of us were working uh, and and we had all the time to to be in church and serve God and study the Word of God and, and have our children raised in that atmosphere. And it's amazing what God has done, the things that we have prayed for and, and what we, we've seen in our life. She went, uh, you know, from a, a, a very, she was serving God, loving God, and then um, had some financial issues, had to move out of state and trust God each and every day just for a meal. And she said, God, what are you doing to me? I, I was just serving you, loving you. And now here I am with nothing. My family is losing everything. And I started ministering to her about tithing. And I said, you know, I think you need to start tithing and tithe what you want to make. And uh, she ended up starting a business. She would tithe 100% of her profits, which that was $100, $200, $300. Mm -hmm. But when you're believing God for your next meal, that's a lot. My friend has believed God all the way and is now a millionaire. Mm, and I'm you know, and this is just like a, a couple of short years. And then to see, you know, just raising raising my boys in church and believing God uh, for signs and wonders and now serving in the United States Congress, God will take anyone from any situation and do tremendous things. And uh, I, I think I'm personal experience that God has a, a reputation of of working with people who no one else believed could amount to much. Uh, I, I had to make a difficult choice and leave high school my, my senior year uh, just to support my family. And I, I later got my GED. Uh, you know, that's not your typical congressman, <laughs> but God can work with Amen. what people would say are real losers and make, <laughs> make oh. them victorious champions. Man, that is that's awesome. awesome. I, I tell you, this is encouraging to me. Find somebody who's born again, <laughs> loves God, loves the Word, is preaching tithing. I wonder how many Congress people up there are tithers. Wow. Uh, right. That's a pretty that's good incredible. indication of where you stand with the Lord when you're able to take part of, part of what you've got and give it to the ministry. Let me just mention real quickly that we have a Truth and Liberty Conference that's coming up on September the 10th and the 11th. That'll be the 20th anniversary of 9-11. And Congresswoman Boebert has said that, you know, if she can work it out, she will be a part of that, whether it's Zoom or in person. So we would love for you to make plans to be with us. It's, it's going to be an awesome time. And we've got some special musicals that are being written just specifically for this celebration. And it's not going to be a time of remembering how terrible everything is. It's going to be celebrating this great nation that has withstood the attack on it for all these years. Amen. So. Mario Murillo is going to be ministering. Oh, yeah. That'll be E.W. Awesome. Jackson. Yeah, E.W. Jackson. Do you happen to know him, Lauren? 
Yes, I, I know of him, not not personally. I tell you what, that man is awesome. I love that man, and he is he's right there in the Washington D.C. area, and he's mm -hmm. he's really powerful. So we're going to take some questions here in just a little bit. But what's on your heart? What do you want to share? with people who are watching this about the Congress, maybe to encourage them or to warn them about some of these uh, bills that are coming through, whatever you want to say. Uh, sure, there's a, a lot of alarming legislation that has passed the House, and we need to keep the filibuster in place to make sure it does not pass the Senate and get to the president's desk. Uh, there is H.R. 1. Uh, they call it for the People Act, but it's not for the people. That's right. It's for, it's for dirty politicians. Mm -hmm. um, it actually even ma matches taxpayer dollars to campaign funds. Uh, I don't want my tax dollars to go to somebody's campaign. If I want to donate to a campaign, I want that to be my own free will and Amen. not be taxed to do so. Uh, and of course, it gets rid of voter ID laws and will fundamentally transform our country. Uh, there's, there's a lot that's going through. I am proud to serve on the Natural Resource Committee and the Budget Committee. But unfortunately, a lot of the legislation that's coming through is not going through committees. Uh, and, and so that's another thing about Congress just not having regular order right now. Committee hearings aren't meeting regularly. Uh, Republicans on the Natural Resource Committee, we have to make our own committee hearings up and, uh, and gather our own witnesses so we can have something to submit into the congressional record because the committee as a whole is not meeting. Uh, so we're not having testimonies and hearings and markups like we should. Uh, so just like the $1.9 trillion COVID uh, bill that we saw pass, that was a budget reconciliation and it didn't come through the budget committee. Uh, and and we, we saw that pass and it passed the Congress or the, the Senate because it only needed a majority vote being a budget reconciliation. It wasn't exactly a law. They were just reconciling the budget. And that's why we saw that pass. But there are other things that we need people calling their representatives calling their senators and letting them know, do not pass this, do not pass DC statehood, uh, do not pass the Equality Act that fundamentally ends girls sports in America. Yeah. And we're not talking about eight year old soccer. We're talking about post puberty sports. We're talking about girls who have worked their whole lives to earn a scholarship and now have to worry about being outplayed by a boy. We're talking about women getting in an MMA ring and having their skulls crushed by a man. We are, uh, we, we're, look at the jails uh, in the jail in Washington that allowed a man to identify as a woman and go into a woman's pod. He was a sexual predator and he sexually assaulted this woman. This is, uh, it has nothing to do with women's rights and it's certainly not equality for women. And so these are things that we cannot allow to pass. And there's, there's a lot of very progressive legislation that's coming through and they're trying to get it through quickly because they know their time is short and we will win the house back in 2022. So uh, last thing before we go to some questions from the viewer, you mentioned that we will win the House back. How are things looking? How are the Democrats feeling? I've read some things that they are literally in panic mode and just trying to cram everything through because they see the handwriting on the wall. Absolutely. Look at the vacancies and the special elections that are taking place. The Republicans that are winning that uh, with with um, with the late Ron White's uh, wife winning uh, that primary, coming out on top in that primary, that shows that the MAGA agenda, the America First agenda, is still strong. This was a swing district in Texas, I believe it's Texas Six, and uh, and this is a swing district, and a Democrat did not come out uh, in the primary. There are two Republicans uh, facing off uh, against one another, and I, I do hope that it's Mrs. White who comes out of that victorious. Um, she certainly has uh, a, a conservative background and, and stands with members of the Freedom Caucus like Chairman Biggs and, and Jim Jordan and myself. And so I, I really hope to see that. But Democrats know that uh, people are frustrated and they do not like this extreme agenda. We have been watching rioting and looting and the burning down of businesses um, while being told that our police need to be defunded and our Second Amendment rights need to be t stripped. Uh, they're not going to stand for that. Uh, we saw a record amount of gun sales because people will protect themselves. Uh, it's our most basic right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And if they want to defund our police officers, uh, we're, we need to take uh, control of that ourselves. And uh, they, they, I, I believe that they've 
overstepped and they know that we certainly have a good chance of taking the house back in 2022 and I look forward to it. Amen. Well, I know a lot of our viewers are really excited to hear from you and to hear that there's somebody there that God's using. So could we put up Lauren's uh, web address again? And I know that a lot of our viewers would like to be a part of this. And so please go there and find out what's happening and contribute. Have we got some questions that have We've come got in? a lot I of questions. I bet you we got a lot of questions. <laughs> All right, Lauren, are you ready for this? I, I'm ready. All right. <laughs> okay, here's a, here's a really uh, useful one right off the bat, is uh, how can I become involved locally in politics? That is the most important thing to do. And the first thing I would say is show up. Uh, that's exactly what I did. I started showing up to meetings and letting my voice be heard. Uh, I, I didn't always know exactly the all, all the details to to speak to, but I knew what I wanted to see in the direction and uh, and I, what I wanted to speak against and speak for. And so I would show up to meetings, uh, whether it was county commissioner meetings or city council meetings, and allow my voice to be heard. Uh, the your school board is the most important part of your government, uh, of, of, a part of our all of our government. They determine our curriculums and have so much um, authority and influence in your community. So get involved there. I do believe that more Christians need to step up. A lot of Christians like to step back and say, I don't get involved with politics uh, because that's not that's not very godly. It absolutely is godly, Amen. and we Amen. need righteous men and women to step up. God is removing the politicians and installing leaders. Um, so don't wait for an invitation. If you need permission, here it is. I give you permission Amen. to step up. Mm. There are important conversations having being had at tables that Christians need to be a part of because the Creator lives on the inside of them and they have the answers. We just had a citizen, or a, um, what was it? It wasn't... Candidate Academy. Candidate Academy this last Saturday where I think 30 people showed up mm -hmm. and they're running for offices. Mm -hmm. And we had people come in and train them how to do that. And it was awesome. So praise God, that's great advice. You got another question? Yeah, uh, we've got a couple of viewers here who are asking about election integrity. And they're wondering if you have any uh, news or information about that subject and, uh, and what you see in the future as far as making sure that our elections are fair. Uh, so this certainly needs to start at the states. And we see states that are taking action and fortifying their election laws and, and even performing audits like we're seeing in Arizona. And I've, I've heard of some others that are uh, certainly coming. Um, but it starts at the state. And we need to be unified as one and, um, and, and let them know that we aren't backing down. We aren't being silenced on this. Um, I refuse to bow down to the cancel mob. And Amen. so just because they tell me I'm not allowed to, to to speak about election integrity doesn't mean I, I'm going to. We, we sat for nearly four years um, hearing that President Trump was uh, was not duly elected, that there was Russian interference and that there there needed to be um, more election integrity and that, our, that there were issues with that. Never not once, uh, never once did we silence them. We, we presented them with facts and data and the other side of the story. We never told them that they couldn't talk about a certain t subject. So um, keep moving forward. Uh, I, I don't want to see Congress get too involved when it comes to legislation uh, because then you're looking at federalizing our elections and that's not what we want. We want the states to be in control of their elections. We are fighting against that with HR1. They want our elections federalized. They want a DC takeover of our elections and I am fighting against that. So all of these states, there are numerous states, Texas I think just passed something this mm -hmm. last week. So all of these states that are passing election laws and stuff. Are they saying that the federal government could come in and just wipe their laws out and take control? That's exactly what HR1 would do. All of these measures uh, are, are Democrats that, uh, are, are what the Democrats are using um, to gain power. Uh, it's a political gain for them and uh, federalizing elections and paying for candidates to run for office, you know, is absolutely a, a part of that power grab, and they could come in and nullify st state rights. And and what we saw, all of the very suspect, unconstitutional, un-American things that we saw in the 2020 elections, is what they are trying to codify in HR1. And uh, so we cannot let that pass the Senate uh, because 
our elections will never, ever look the same in America. Well, let me interrupt and ask a question. If the Democrats see the handwriting on the wall and they know uh, how their constituents are going to possibly vote them out, are some of them trying to retain their seats and possibly going to join with the conservatives on this issue and oppose H.R. 1? What's your feeling on that? We did not see that in the House of Representatives. Um, it, it passed down party lines, and uh, in the Senate, we'll need uh, 10 Republicans to join uh, the Democrats in voting yes on that uh, because we have the filibuster. So we have to keep the filibuster, and, uh, and we need Senator Manchin and, uh, and Senator uh, Sinema to, to hold strong to their word and keep the filibuster, and then, of course, keep uh, some of our Republicans um, in line and, and have them vote no against that. Mm. Well, what can people do to encourage Senator Manchin and uh, Senator Sinema? Uh, Manchin is from West Virginia, Sinema is from Arizona, and they're the two lone Democrats in the Senate that are uh, holding out on abolishing the filibuster. What can we do, even if we're not from their home states, to encourage them in that regard? Phone calls. Uh, that absolutely helps. And uh, I, I know that those phone calls, uh, they are discussed in, in congressional offices. Uh, I, I hear about the phone calls that take place. We take tallies of the topics that come in and, and we respond to those. Uh, you may not talk to the representative or the senator directly yourself, but I promise you their staff is communicating those phone calls that are coming through. I talk to my DC staff and my district staff Every morning we have a conference call, and that may be more than, than some members, but I want to know what people are calling in and talking about. And we listen to the good, the bad, the ugly, the indifferent, uh, the praise. We listen to it all. Uh, so make phone calls. It absolutely matters. Uh, there is staff there whose job is to answer the call and to make note of what was discussed. Well, I tell you what, on our Truth and Liberty website, we'll go ahead and put something up there for those two senators specifically and uh, give the contact information. It may take us a, a day to get that done, but we will do that. And uh, if all of the people watching, we've had as many as 80,000 people watching this, it'd be awesome to just see 80,000 phone calls yes, flood their office. That'd be great. Amen. Well, uh, we've got a question here, uh, Lauren, about this cyber attack on the Keystone Pipeline. Do it's you not know? the Keystone. It was oh, it's a, a coastal. Coastal. Well, what's? Uh, I, I guess I'm not aware of it. So what's going on with that? Well, let her explain it. <laughs> so that yes, that that is pretty new, um, and it's it's interesting that it's affecting uh, 17 states right now, and uh, this is this is what happens when uh, when we have. Um, weak leadership in America. Um, we would have never we would have never seen an attack. I, 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 we didn't see an attack like this when we had strong leadership. And, and really, you can even relate that to what's going on in Israel right now. Uh, I, I don't believe that um, Hezbollah would have ever tried this with President Trump in office because um, they would know the the consequences that are in place. And so uh, w with that being said, elections absolutely have consequences and we need to make sure that we stay engaged. We need America to remain the strongest country uh, in the world and, and we cannot have any room um, for attacks or hacks and uh, as, even domestically. Um, and so we need to be able to um, have strong leadership. And so whatever we can do uh, to, to make sure that that's in place, that's well, we've got another question here. Thank you for that uh, about um, the right to bear arms. Uh, Daniel on chat is asking, why is it important for me to have the right to conceal and carry? Uh, so I support the Second Amendment and I don't apologize for it. Um, I, it is your right because you, your most basic right is to protect your life, to protect yourself, your family. It is a natural right uh, uh, to, to defend yourself. Uh, and, and this is a God-given right. Government didn't give us our rights. Uh, government is instituted to secure our rights. And uh, we, the governed, we give consent to be governed. Um, but there's some stuff that we need to put our foot down and say we're not consenting to this. And certainly when it comes to uh, stripping away the Second Amendment, abolishing the Second Amendment, we have uh, a president right now 
who says that no amendment is absolute, and that is terrifying. That is. Uh, mm. th because that's our freedom of speech, that's our freedom of religion, that's a freedom of press, freedom to petition our government, which we've seen uh, how many how many states you weren't able to go in and petition your government and, and your state capital or even the, the United States capital. We just reopened our offices. And so uh, the Second Amendment is there to protect all of your other amendments. Uh, I, I love having the right to proclaim Jesus as my Lord, but uh, if, if government comes to take that away from me, I need to be able to have a check on government to make sure that I can keep my uh, my God-given rights. And uh, that, that really is the basis of the Second Amendment, to defend yourself and to have a check on a tyrannical government has nothing to do with hunting. Yeah, and you know, ev historically, every tyrant has always come in and taken away the weapons because yes. that makes, that's the only way they can enforce their tyrannical things. And so it's, it's not about just your ability to hunt or something like this. It's your ability to withstand the government if they come and try and force something on you. So people don't like to talk about that, but it's necessary that we That's have right. it. Well, uh, Lauren, you defeated a five-term incumbent Republican uh, for your current seat. And a lot of people say that a real conservative can't win in Colorado. You know, we have a trifecta here in the state government. Um, but what is your what is your response to that argument? Obviously, you won. What was the secret to uh, your success? The, cons the the secret is being a true conservative. The secret is being true to your convictions and and being real and genuine with people and connecting with people. I went everywhere. I met with everyone, and I still do. Uh, I think even uh, politicians who uh, get into office stay in their DC bubble and forget about the people who they work for and forget who actually sent them there. And, and I get it, it can be very easy um, to only listen to the opinions from Washington DC because there are a lot of them, uh, but you have to come back to the people and connect with them and, and work with them and hear their issues because they are who you are representing. And so uh, at the end of the day, that's exactly what I come home to do. I fly home every weekend that we're in session. I, I spend Sundays with my family, but I'm out in the district meeting with as many people on both sides of the aisle as possible. And uh, I, I, I think I said this earlier, or I say it a lot at least, when we run as conservatives, we win. Amen. But when we legislate as conservatives, the people win. And you know, I really believe that most people are conservative. Even here in Colorado, a blue state, they, the people are conservative and it's only when conservatives don't stand up for it and they're apologetic yes. for it that they lose. When they stand, yes. conservatives win. Mm -hmm. I agree. Yes, well, what, what I see is really interesting. I'm in all sorts of meetings all throughout my district when it comes to schools, when it comes to energy, I meet with commissioners and mayors and state elected officials uh, and f f people on both sides of the aisle um, with community hospitals. Every meeting is nearly identical. They present to me issues from the Democrat state legislature, these unfunded mandates that are coming from these policies that the Democrat uh, supermajority legislator here in Colorado has implemented their unfunded mandates. They believe that it's going to actually help a community, but there is a urban and rural divide. And what ha what may work in urban areas, which I don't believe they do, yeah. uh, what, what they agree. think works in an ur urban area absolutely doesn't work in a rural area. So now all the people here in Colorado's third district are hurting because of these policies. And their only solution is the federal government giving them money to help cope with what the state is doing. So I'm working on messaging to the people in Colorado and telling them that these policies are negatively impacting their communities. And Democrats may believe that they are voting with their heart. They may believe they're voting compassionately, but these policies are not compassionate and they're not helping our communities. They are hurting us and they're destroying us. Just look at the Southern border. That's not compassion not compassionate to signal to poor and desperate people to come and, and risk this journey, risk your lives. Um, mom sending their daughters with the plan B pill, expecting them to be sexually assaulted mm. and to break our laws, cross our, our border, and then we'll take care of them if they make it. Uh, that's not compassionate. That is immoral and it's disgusting. And unfortunately, that's how a lot of these policies result. Mm. 
Amen. Amen. Man, I like what I'm hearing. This is Amen. really good, Lauren. Thank you so much for doing that. You know, I got another question. Oh, we've got lots of them. But well, we got one more time. What time for one more? I'll just throw this out there, uh, Lauren. Are you concerned about the censorship through big tech, and what can we do about it? So that absolutely is uh, is a big problem. Um, big big tech has gone off the rails, and it's past time we take a stand. I support a repeal of Section 230. I support reining in big tech. And the reality is, big tech targets conservatives every single mm -hmm. day and acts as a partisan political uh, operative. Uh, who made Facebook and Twitter the arbiters? of right and wrong. I have had hundreds of thousands of followers removed from my Twitter account, and I am shadow banned regularly, uh, and, and they have just gone too far. Can you imagine if Verizon Wireless had an agent who interrupted your phone call and said, hey, we don't like what you're talking about. We're disconnecting this call, and you're not allowed to contact this person ever again. No one would ever stand for that, but yet we're allowing big tech to do this every single day. Oh, that's great. I've said for a while that I think they need to be treated like utilities and regulated, so. Yeah. But yes. That is excellent. Uh, let's put up Lauren's uh, uh, website again. I encourage people to support her. We've got a minute and a half left. And Lauren, we just, I want to say for all the people watching, man, praise God for you listening to God and jumping into this battle because it's not one that I would like to be in. <laughs> the. Uh, secular news media nowadays, man, you got a huge target on your back. And so we're praying for you and believing that God is protecting you and your family from all of these assaults. And we're also praying and believing that God is supplying you with all of the resources that you need to accomplish what He sent you there to do. So thank you again for everything you're doing. You are a blessing. Amen. Awesome. Thank you so much. I appreciate you both and, and all of your viewers. God bless you all. And I hope to talk with you again soon. Well, that's awesome. And like we said, she is going to participate in our Truth and Liberty Conference some, some way, either in person or by Zoom on uh, September the 10th and the 11th. Again, we want to thank CTN for carrying this on their network and uh, doing that. What a blessing that is. And remember that we do this every Monday night at 6 p.m. Mountain Time, and we have on great guests just like Congresswoman Lauren Boebert. And man, it's just awesome. So God is doing some great things, and I believe that this is one of your outlets to find that out. Also, go to our website, truthandliberty.net. We've got great things on there that could really help you to keep informed, and we are going to put on that information about how you can contact these senators and flood them with calls. Thank you, Congresswoman. Thank all of you for watching. God bless you, and we'll see you again next week for our Monday night Truth and Liberty livecast. <laughs> There is a time for us to stand up. And I'm saying that it is time for the body of Christ to rise up and get out of the four walls of a church. One of the responsibilities of the church and Christians is to destroy the works of the devil wherever we find them. The real love, the real peace, the real joy doesn't come by being triggered by everything, but by being vertically connected to the creator of the universe and having his life flow through you. Father, I just believe that this is helping wake the church up. And I thank you that as each one of us goes out and does our part, that Father, this is going to make a difference. Join us next time for the Truth and Liberty broadcast. Find tonight's episode and related articles and links at truthandliberty.net. Truth and Liberty is viewer supported. If you'd like to help us continue our live casts, you can make a donation at truthandliberty.net. 